Before I can begin my interpretation of the story of Skyward Sword, there's another story you should know first. According to an old Chinese legend, during the Tang Dynasty, there was once a young man named Wei Gu, who was on his way to meet the woman he believed would be his wife. Along the way, he came across an old man sitting beneath the moon. Beside him was a large bag filled with red thread. He was reading a book. Wei Gu asked the old man what he was doing. The old man, whose name was Yu Lao, told Wei Gu that his book reveals the names of every couple that will ever marry. When two people are destined to marry one another, Yu Lao ties the two together with a piece of red thread. This red thread of fate may twist or tangle, but it will never break. So Wei Gu asked the old man who his wife would be, and Yu Lao led him to the market and pointed to a little girl in the arms of an impoverished, half-blind beggar woman. In 14 years, this girl would be the one Wei Gu would wed. Wei Gu was horrified. He wanted to sever this thread of fate. So he took a rock and threw it at the little girl, striking her in the head, and ran away. Some say instead that he had ordered a servant to kill the girl with a knife. Years pass, and eventually Wei Gu becomes betrothed to a woman who always keeps an adornment on her forehead. When Wei Gu asks her about this adornment, his bride reveals that she bears a scar underneath it where some vicious person had once tried to kill her when she was just a little girl in her mother's arms. Wei Gu quickly realizes that he is the one who had attempted this murder. But the red thread of fate that binds two together never breaks. This legend of the red thread of fate helped inspire one of Japan's most successful films, Your Name, in 2016 which updated the story a bit. The red thread also plays a role in The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. However, the key reference to it was hidden away in many localized versions of the game, where audiences were probably assumed to be less familiar with the concept. But when we recover this missing thread, it just might change the way we see the game's entire narrative tapestry. Released 25 years after the original Legend of Zelda, Skyward Sword revealed the origins of the central conflict of the series, with a story that takes place long before that of any of the other Zelda games. It all begins with a rock, floating in the sky. On top of this rock is the town of Skyloft, sitting beneath the watchful gaze of the statue of the goddess Hylia and every person who lives here is said to be one half of a pair. This is explained by the school headmaster, Gepora. He tells us that underneath the statue of the goddess, every child in Skyloft meets their lifelong companion, a guardian bird known as a Loftwing. But there was something different about a boy named Link. The bird that came to him was Crimson, a rare breed thought to have disappeared. And then, Gepora says something that seems to embarrass Link, while Zelda stares off into the distance. Given these expressive animations, the game's English translation felt like it might be missing something. In the Japanese text, Gepora says, Link and that crimson bird, by a mysterious anishi, they are tied together. That word anishi can refer to fate, especially as a mysterious force that connects people. It also can mean a relationship that's been brought about by fate. This concept is expressed in English a few lines later, when it's said that the two were meant for each other. But without this sweeping reaction shot, the line loses some of its emphasis. And that matters because this is an important line. It implies the workings of fate, emphasizes the color red, and includes the language of two being tied together. And it happens to do this using three words that each begin with the same kanji radical that means thread. So I think this line is foreshadowing the role of the red thread of fate in the story 
that's about to unfold. Skyward Sword's narrative is in some ways a retelling of the legend of the Red Thread, with the role of Yu Lao being represented by the statue of the goddess. Throughout the game, there's a pattern of fateful meetings that take place beneath the feet of the statue. This begins when we first see Link and Zelda together. Even though the characters have known each other their whole lives, the cinematography emphasizes the place where they're standing. This is also the place where Link and his Crimson Loftwing first met, another match characterized by a strong sense of a Nishi. The pattern continues when Link finds a hidden room under the feet of the statue. Inside the room, he becomes acquainted with a servant of the goddess named Phi. He also finds the sword Phi inhabits that will soon be forged into none other than the Master Sword. This union between the hero and that legendary blade endures for ages. And this fateful match was made on a night when the statue of the goddess is shown standing dramatically under the moon. But there's still one more match that's yet to be made. On that night, when Link goes to the goddess statue under the moon, he not only meets a new companion, he also learns what fate has in store for him, just like when Wei Gu met the old man under the moon. Link learns from Phi that he is destined to abolish the shadow of Apocalypse from the lands below Skyloft. But unlike Wei Gu, Link rushes forward to meet his fate head on. Of course, he mostly just wants to find Zelda after her fall to the surface. There's an interesting scene when Link arrives down on the surface. At the edge of a huge pit, Link has a vision of a beast emerging from it. And then suddenly, he clutches his forehead in pain. But why does his forehead hurt? Link doesn't have a wound there. No one's thrown a rock at him or asked a servant to strike him in the face. The pain appears to be triggered by the presence of the beast. It seems like there's some mysterious connection between them. Let's make a note of that foreshadowing. Further down the road, Link crosses paths with someone who is also searching for Zelda. The demon lord, Girahim, needs Zelda in order to fully revive his master, <laughs> that monster in the pit Link had seen earlier. Girahim and Link battle each other and then go their separate ways. But since both of them are searching for the same person, they just keep running into each other again and again. Let's look at the way Girahim conducts himself during these encounters. On one occasion, when he's very angry, he pours the fires of his wrath into a huge rock, and then he throws that rock at Link. We have heard a story like this before, although in this case, the rock sprouts legs and chases its target down. On another occasion, when Girahim wants to get rid of Link, he enlists the help of a servant. Now there's a lot of symbolism at play in this battle, but for now, let's just note how Girahim has been acting a little bit like Wegu. So after so many attempts to murder Link, Girahim turns around and sees Link standing there before him once again. Let's look at what he says in the Japanese text. He says, Hi Link, you're still alive? For us to still be meeting like this, and given the way that this just keeps happening, it has to mean that there is a red thread of fate tying us together. This is an incredibly romantic scene. But the English translation didn't mention the color of that thread of fate. So I think this speech is a hint at the overall structure of the game's story. But there is some symbolism that's missing from this scene. It doesn't take place beneath the statue of the goddess, and we still don't see a scar on anyone's forehead. Well, I guess that's up for interpretation. But what we do see is this. Link might be connected by fate to someone he doesn't want to have anything to do with. This brings us to the game's final act, and yes, there will be spoilers here if you haven't played this far. By now, that monster in the pit has been escaping over and over again. And every time this has happened so far, Link's been able to deal with the problem by striking it in the forehead over and over and over again. 
When Link finally reunites with Zelda, she tells him they need a way to destroy the monster before the monster destroys the world. But they're going to need some additional help to do this. And so, Zelda suggests that Link should enlist the help of the gods who created the world. Back when the world began, these old gods left behind a relic imbued with their power, the Triforce, capable of granting any desire of the one who possesses it. Link finds the Triforce, and he asks it to fulfill his desire. He asks the Triforce to kill the monster down on the ground below. The Triforce obeys. It takes hold of that rock floating in the sky, and it throws that rock down to the earth. And that beast in the pit is trampled to death beneath the feet of the statue of the goddess. And what happens next has already been foreshadowed. All the way back at the beginning of the game, Link's other half had gone missing. A flight contest was about to begin, and without his loft wing, Link would be disqualified. In response to his distress, the school headmaster stops the clock, giving Link the time he needs to find his partner. Turns out the bird had been imprisoned, locked away beneath the town at the hands of a group of bullies. And now, it's Girahim who's been left all alone without his beastly partner, who is just killed by a group of bullies. The only thing left for him to do is to stop the clock. He takes Zelda back to the distant past, to a time when the Demon King is still alive and imprisoned beneath the place where the goddess statue stands in the present day. The process of revival is completed, and now our pattern of fateful meetings is also completed, and Link finds himself facing the one he had ordered a servant to kill, the one who had been struck down by a rock, the one who now bears a scar on his forehead. His name begins with a kanji comprised of radicals that suggest the knot at the end of a thread. And he curses Link and Zelda, warning that his hatred will follow them forever. And there is a certain incarnation of this hatred who tends to always keep an adornment on his forehead. This incarnation is bound to Link and Zelda and all their successors by a red thread of fate. And although this thread might twist or tangle, it will never break. The scar that appears on the forehead of Demise in the past was given to him long before Link came along, probably when he was thrown in the pit, after trying to take the Triforce that the goddess Hylia was given to protect. Hylia wanted to use the Triforce herself, but this was forbidden. The Triforce cannot be wielded by a god. And so, reborn in the mortal form of Zelda, the goddess enlisted the help of a servant. She wove the threads of his fate and led him to that which the gods who created the world had left behind in the garden. She handed him this fruit and told him to take a bite. And a rock fell from the sky like a bomb. And Link and Zelda fell under an eternal curse, imprisoned in an endlessly recurring cycle of violence and suffering, bound to the Demon King by an unbreakable thread. The three of them doomed to wander this blood-soaked sea of darkness for all time. Is there any hope of escape? Well, there's another story you should know first. One day, Shakyamuni Buddha was taking a stroll through paradise. At the edge of a lotus pond, he stopped and looked down. Far down, in the deepest depths of hell below, 
he saw a murderer thrashing about in the pond of blood like a dying frog. His name was Kandata, and in all his life he had done but one good deed. There had once been a tiny spider on the ground below, and Kandata raised his foot to trample it. But then he thought, even this puny creature is a living thing, and the spider crept away. Now it just so happened that beside the lotus pond, a spider had woven a web. Buddha gently lifted a strand from that web, and he lowered the spider's thread down into the depths of hell. Kandata took the thread and began to climb, pulling himself at last out from the pit, until he realized there were others climbing up with him. Thousands upon thousands of hell beings were clambering up the thread that Kandata hoped would be his escape. How could one thread hold them all? The spider's thread is mine, he said. Get off. And at that very moment just above him, the thread broke. There's an interesting editing choice when Skyward Sword begins. We hear about the day when Demise and his army launched their brutal assault on the surface world. They destroyed the land, killed without hesitation, and then... And then... The narration pauses. For 15 long seconds, we're left to contemplate this hell. We're then told that the demons wanted to take the Triforce, that ultimate power the gods just happened to leave behind. What we are not told is why the gods chose to create the Triforce in the first place. Because it seems like the existence of the Triforce is what set in motion all this suffering. Why did the gods leave behind the Triforce? The goddess Hylia, who is left with the task of protecting it, seems to have been asking herself this question. Zelda says that no one knows why the Triforce was created. But here's what she thinks. It was made by gods, it can't be used by gods. Maybe it was meant to give hope to those who aren't gods. Aside from this hint, there's not a lot that the game directly reveals about the Triforce. But this line indicates that the game is inviting us to question what motivated the gods to create it. I'm going to offer my own interpretation based on the game's use of literary devices. But let me know if you think I'm reaching. Let's begin naturally, with the Brothers Karamazov, Fyodor Dostoevsky's final novel. In a chapter titled Rebellion, Ivan Karamazov brings up the subject of that forbidden fruit that had been left in the Garden of Eden. He then tells his brother Alyosha a story he wrote called The Grand Inquisitor. In this story within a story, Christ reappears on Earth, only to be arrested by the Spanish Inquisition. The Grand Inquisitor plans to execute Jesus on account of his decision to allow humanity free will. How many people have suffered hell because of Jesus thirsting for love freely given? Jesus responds with a kiss, and the Inquisitor releases the one he'd imprisoned. There's another story within a story just a few chapters later, a fable that Dostoevsky had heard from a peasant woman. Grushenka tells this story about a wicked person who in all her life had done just one good deed. She had once given an onion to someone who's hungry. When this woman dies and ends up in a burning lake, an angel descends from heaven holding an onion. The woman takes hold of the onion, but everyone else in the lake takes hold of her. And so she screams, it's my onion, not yours. And at that very moment, the onion breaks. Both of these embedded stories appear within the context of the book's larger narrative, which is about a man who uses his brother as a proxy to murder his devilish father. There's some thematically relevant school kid drama in there as well. The reader is left to consider the relationship between these embedded stories and the one that contains them. Skyward Sword is not exactly the Brothers Karamazov. The game is about Zelda, using Link as her proxy, 
in order to murder the devil, with some thematically relevant school kid drama in there as well. But what the game does have in common with Dostoevsky is that both use the device of a story within a story. After the Russian Onion Fable was published in the Brothers Karamazov, the onion became a spider's thread in a story written a few years later by philosopher Paul Karras as part of his efforts to transmit Buddhist ideas to the West. That story was later rewritten for kids by the Japanese author Akutagawa Ryunosuke, who emphasized the contrast between Buddha enjoying a nice walk and Kandata thrashing about in a pond of blood like a dying frog. And as many other Zelda fans have already pointed out, that story seems to have inspired the design of Skyward Sword's fourth dungeon, the Ancient Cistern. When I refer to the Ancient Cistern as a story within a story, what I want to emphasize is the way that the story that unfolds within this dungeon reflects the story of the game that it's nested within. One day up in Skyloft, Zelda hears a voice calling her from down beneath the clouds. Nobody in Skyloft knows whether anything even exists down there, but Zelda can't help but feel curious. While taking a walk up in paradise, she stops and looks down. In a paper on embedded narrative in game design, Hua Xin Wei has pointed out that in video games, you don't really need to shift narrators to have a story within a story. A game level with its own mini-story could be considered a case of what he calls modal embedding, especially if there's a shift in reality involved. Now there is a slight shift that takes place when Link enters the ancient cistern, because the first thing you see looming above a lotus pond is a giant statue with the appearance of Buddha, intruding upon this game world from a different reality. Kinda like the Mario characters that showed up in Link's Awakening. This is not the first instance of Buddhist symbolism in the game, but it is blatant enough to interfere with the player's connection with Link. The player might recognize the statue, but Link is left in a state of ignorance. Still, both Link and the player will probably notice that this statue happens to be holding an awful lot of money in its open hands. With this kind of money, you could return to Skyloft, ring the bell at Beetle's shop, take hold of the thread that descends from the heavens, and be reeled in towards the fulfillment of your desire, like a fish that took the bait. It might be a good idea to remember this imagery, just in case we come across another statue holding treasure in its hands. Speaking of fish, Link is eventually swallowed by one, so to speak. Nintendo Black Crisis has pointed out on his YouTube channel that in Buddhism, the carp can symbolize happiness because it has complete freedom of movement in the water. I think this fish could also represent Link's loftwing that carries him through the skies towards the swirling gaps in the clouds. Because in a similar way, this fish spits Link out right at the edge of a whirlpool, through which Link descends to the lower level beneath the lotus pond. Down below, he finds himself overlooking a huge pit, with a treasure chest at the bottom. The fish brings Link back up to the world above, and there he finds a switch that controls the great statue, sending it down to the lower level. Using the statue like an elevator, Link is now able to explore the lower region. Similar to Akutagawa's description of hell, down here we see a mountain of needles and a pond of... something. But you can reach into this monster's skull and switch off the flow of... those impurities. Continuing on in a counterclockwise path, you'll encounter what appear to be prayer wheels, as Nintendo Black Crisis again has pointed out. All but one of these wheels are covered in ivy, but there's this one large uncovered wheel that draws particular attention to itself. Prayer wheels are most commonly found in Tibetan Buddhism. These wheels can be filled with thousands, millions, sometimes even billions of prayers. By turning the wheel clockwise, it's as though all these prayers are being recited, generating good karma that has a purifying effect. As I understand it, you generally don't want to spin the wheel backwards, counterclockwise. 
it would be like having the reverse effect. Given the presence of these spikes, I think that's the intended symbolism here. But Link changes the direction this wheel is spinning. He takes a few steps clockwise, and then... And then he ends up in a corner, so he reverses it again, and climbs away. And the wheel goes on spinning the wrong way, for who knows how long. In all this time, it had only moved clockwise for a moment. Which is kind of like the way Kandata had lived. In all his life, he had done only one good deed. One small act of mercy. Just past the prayer wheels, there's a silver thread hanging down from above. Beneath the statue of the goddess, Zelda once sang about the union of earth and sky. Now in the biblical book of Genesis, there's a story about humanity trying to build a tower that would reach up to the sky. It's often been thought that these builders had wanted to climb up to heaven via this tower, although some say that the text itself has more to do with human desire to build empires. The Tower of Babel is frequently depicted like the Roman Colosseum in a spiral shape, similar to the pit where Demise is imprisoned. The structure's historical counterpart would have been a ziggurat, similar to the one that we see in the Laneru Desert, but Herodotus described Babylon's temple tower as being encircled by a ramp going up to the top, and Renaissance artists gave the tower this Roman-style architecture to comment upon the church in Rome. The Tower of Babel gets flipped upside down in the Christian New Testament, figuratively speaking, to symbolize heaven coming down to earth when God's Holy Spirit descends from above in an effort to unite humanity together as one, as though we were all holding on to a common thread. And in Skyward Sword, the symbol of an upside-down spiral tower adorned with Roman arches bears a striking resemblance to the symbol of the spider's thread. With all this clockwise spinning, maybe someone remembers that prayer wheel. This is the structure where Link finds the Triforce, a silver thread hanging down from above. Link takes hold of the spider's thread and begins to climb. But then he realizes there are others climbing up with him. Monsters burst from the ground and they clamor up the thread. And what does Link do in response? He shakes them off, one after another, casting them back down into the depths as he pulls himself out from the pit. His escape draws near. And at that very moment, the thread never breaks. Maybe I should have been more specific. What I meant to say was that the red thread never breaks. <laughs> Even though Link has crawled out from the pit, he doesn't get to stay back on the upper level of the ancient cistern for very long, because it turns out there was something he didn't take with him down on the lower floor. So, he flips the switch, the statue goes back up, Link goes back down, and down in the bottom of the pit that had been sealed away beneath the statue, Link opens the chest and finds... Gratitude. And then monsters burst from the ground. And then... The statue descends from above of its own free will. 
did you think you were controlling it? And the monsters in the pit are trampled to death beneath the feet of the statue of Buddha, a skillful teacher of nonviolence and compassion. This is how Skyward Sword uses a story within a story to subvert its own story. The violent statue of Buddha is acting out of character, but since Link doesn't recognize Buddha, only the player would have noticed this. And because the embedded story substantially resembles the frame story, this irony should make us ask a few questions. So here's a question I have. If Wei Gu had given his servant an order to kill the girl in the marketplace, why is she still alive 14 years later? If Link had asked the Triforce to destroy the Demon King, why is the Demon King still alive? Maybe the servant hesitated. Maybe the statue is not simply an elevator. And maybe the Triforce has a hidden will of its own. Perhaps it meant to leave behind that one loose thread. So, why did the gods leave behind the Triforce? Back up in Skyloft, there's a girl in the marketplace who sits at a service desk all day long. If anyone has something valuable that needs to be kept safe, Beatrice will place it into a storage box, and it will be there waiting for you whenever you might need it again. It appears to be a rather thankless task, and to some extent, Beatrice seems to be feeling a bit imprisoned in the same old, same old. But there's this one customer who keeps visiting her over and over and over again. And even though this girl is working at a service job, it turns out she's also a human with a heart. One day, she asks Link to meet her outside of work. And even though Link has been on his way to reunite with another girl who means an awful lot to him, he makes time for the girl from the marketplace. She asks him a question. What do you think about me? The player is given two response options. You store items, or I like you. Now, out of sensitivity to the fact that Link hasn't really had much chance to talk things over with Zelda, I feel inclined to go with the first option. And this girl looks like she's just been struck by a rock. She asks again, what am I to you? And I respond, you are a shopkeeper. <gasps> am I too shy to admit my feelings? No. <gasps> and then one last time she asks, all I am to you is some girl who stores your items. You really think that? At last, the message sinks in. And with that, the thread of hope that she'd been holding onto breaks apart, and she falls back down into the pit. The first thing we learn when Skyward Sword begins is that the prologue's narrator is not human. This narrator, Phi, had been created by the goddess for a single purpose, to aid the chosen hero in fulfilling his destiny. When Demise is defeated, her job has been done, and she asks Link to place the sword she inhabits into its pedestal, at which point she will enter, asleep without end. She tells Link to cut the thread between them. After all, She'd known from the start that she exists for the sake of being used by fate. Out in the Laneru mine, Link encounters the remains of an ancient civilization's workforce. When he strikes a time shift stone, 
the land reverts back to the way it used to be in the distant past, and the robotic workers rise from the dust to immediately resume their labor. And what did they achieve in the end, through all the toil that they toiled at under the sun? Ecological collapse. Their world became a desert waste, a parched land left with only the distant memory of a drop of water. But can we blame the robots for destroying their world? They did their job. They obeyed their programming. They never knew when enough was enough. They never knew what a carp might feel, having complete freedom of movement in the water. After all, robots don't have hearts. They were puppets, all of them, dancing on the strings of fate, carrying out the will of the gods who created them. The servant of the goddess places his knife back in its pedestal and the spirit that inhabited the tool fades away like mere breath. It's all the way it was meant to be. But then Link hears a voice calling him, and Fi tells her companion that she cherishes the memories of the time they spent together. In the opening chapters of The Tale of Genji, a classic work of Japanese literature written by Lady Morisaki, Genji approaches a woman who runs away from him, leaving behind her robe. Genji keeps the robe as a memento, and compares it to a shell left behind by a cicada that departed from the world at summer's end. In a similar way, perhaps, when the old gods departed from the world, they left behind the Triforce. And when Link, Zelda, and their friend with red hair prepare to depart from the world of the past and return back to their own day and age, they leave behind Impa. The servant of the goddess explains that the goddess Hylia had entrusted Impa's clan with the task of preventing demise from reawakening, and as the remnants of the Demon King decay within the Master Sword, someone needs to keep an eye on it. As Impa prepares to begin this vigil, she reminds Zelda of her own duty to the Triforce. This ambiguous line seems to have been misinterpreted in the English text. I think the French translation, for instance, makes a whole lot more sense within the context of the story. Impa reminds Zelda that the power of the Triforce is dangerous and should not be relied upon blindly. Once its work is done, it should go on sleeping quietly, somewhere unnoticed. And the old gods had entrusted Hylia with the task of protecting it. In other words, Hylia is their item check girl, left behind to keep a lonely vigil as all the ages of the world slowly pass by. Perhaps one day, the question will haunt her mind. What am I to you? So, before Zelda leaves her servant behind, she hands Impa her bracelet as a memento. The memory of a drop of water in the midst of the vast expanse of time. It's her way of reminding Impa who she is. She is far more than a servant. And why did the gods leave behind the Triforce? I think it might have been for a similar reason. It reminds those who were created by the gods that their existence is cherished. These small, puny creatures are living things. They're more than just servants. They're given free will.
and how many people have suffered hell as a result. Check out this frog. Frogs can walk on land, swim through water, leap through the air, and it looks like this one could even fly. Yeah, this frog has pretty much got it all, except for this one teensy tiny thing that's lacking, namely, water. The frog's thirsty. So here's something that I find a little odd. Throughout Skyward Sword, you can ask Fi for her analysis of pretty much anything and anyone you encounter in the game. For instance, she can tell you that this froggish creature swimming in lava is a cursed spume, a cowardly monster that spits out evil curses that it stores up in its body. Fi typically has quite a lot to say, but then late in the game, when your path is blocked by a wall of fire beside which is perched this strange frog statue, for whatever reason, Fi has very little to say. The puzzle is simple enough. You read the inscription in front of the frog, you find a nearby water source, you bring the water to the frog, and the flames disappear, and the path opens. The way that Fi has been left in the dark about all this just feels unusual and unresolved. Like there's something more going on here than what the game is telling you up front. And I think that's the point. Fi's ignorance is being used by the game to call our attention towards something important. An answer to a puzzle, perhaps, that's not just going to be handed to you. Because the question of how the Zelda series might resolve its central conflict is a very big question, after all. You know how characters in Zelda games have this way of telling you exactly where to go and what to do to solve a problem, and then dismissing the idea as ridiculous? It happens a lot, and it can be a bit heavy-handed, but it's an indirect way of giving the player hints. Now when it comes to understanding the significance of this frog, I think one of the biggest clues comes from something this Goron says. He tells you that there is a water source nearby, but this weird frog beast is probably not going to carry it for you. What an interesting thing to say. And sure, these frogs don't exactly fly to your aid the first two times around, but when you've got to quench the thirst of this third thirsty frog, your little water bottle is not going to do the trick. You'll need an entire basin full of water, and someone is going to need to carry that water for you. Back up in Skyloft, this someone had been sitting in the scrap shop for years on end, until at last he was brought back to life with the nectar of an ancient flower that Link had found during his adventures beneath the clouds. Once the shop owner had finished the repairs, Link got to meet Scrapper, the flying robot. This guy pretty much has it all. His impressive freedom to move between the sky and the ground below makes him the perfect candidate for transporting heavy objects. But there is one thing he lacks. You see, Scrapper had fallen for Fi the moment they met. And Fi, for her part, quickly apprehended that if Link wanted to put this love-struck robot to work, no further persuasive measures would be required. Link enlists the help of the robot over and over again, and every time Scrapper shows up, it's the same routine over and over and over again. He is so desperately thirsty for Fi's approval, and jealous of Link's bond with her, that he never figures out when enough is enough. But it's like Gaypora said at the start of the game. Sometimes in life, you run into those who covet what others have. Now because Scrapper feels the need to show off in front of Fi, he causes some complications during their trip. 
This leaves the uneasy fellowship with only one choice. Scrapper must pass deep into enemy territory and bear the water basin all the way up to the summit of the volcano, where it must be cast into the mouth of that very big frog. And Link must aid Scrapper in fulfilling this great destiny that is his burden to carry. This is one of my favorite parts of the game, made even better by the constant stream of helpful commentary that Scrapper spits out along the way. There is a folktale from Japan about two frogs who meet at the top of a mountain. And while I don't know whether that's actually being referenced here, I do think that when this thirsty flying show-off arrives at his destination, he encounters his own reflection. He did it! The job is done! What is Fi going to say, having witnessed this incredible achievement? She says... Nothing. And the robot goes back the way he came, having served his purpose of personifying the symbol of the frog. Which is helpful, because at this very point in the game, you're about to be reunited with a few other frogs. If you happen to encounter a frog statue or figurine in Japan, it could mean that something good will come your way. Because in Japanese, the word for frog is pronounced the same way as the word for return. Kairu. Link must be feeling especially lucky after being so nice to that frog from earlier because the one who returns to him is none other than that special someone who is apparently tied to him by a red string of fate. And this guy pretty much has it all. Such beauty, such a pure form, such an exquisite physique, such stunning features, don't you think? But there is one thing he lacks. You see, Girahim wants information from Link about where to find the gateway that will lead him to Zelda, the goddess reborn, whom he can use to bring the Demon King back to life. Quench my thirst to clear your path. Refuse this offer, and Link will find himself facing once more the flames of Girahim's anger. And as Girahim does his best impression of a very thirsty frog, he tells Link that the one thing he lacks is mercy. Now let's double check the original text, because this is an important line. Girahim tells Link that what he lacks is... Kagen. That word Kagen refers to moderation, making adjustments to get something right. Girahim is saying that he goes too far, that he never knows when enough is enough. He is, after all, a sword spirit like Fi. He's the sword of the Demon King, Demise. A perfect killing machine with hardly a flaw. He's not the type who would ever give his enemy an onion, so to speak, or allow a spider in his path to crawl away with its life. And when Link beats him in combat, before he runs away, Girihim spits out a curse, swearing that no matter what, he will drag Link into an eternity of torment. He will show Link hell, without hope of escape. And he succeeds. He captures Zelda and carries her to the Demon King. And as he stands atop this summit of all his hopes and dreams, he happens to meet a certain someone else with remarkable hair. And when the job at last has been done, what does Demise say to the servant who lifted him out from the pit? Why would Demise say anything to a tool? 
Check out this frog. He's very thirsty. He wants the goddess Hylia and the Triforce. It's interesting how a game that's using the symbolism of carps would have as its antagonist a creature known as the Imprisoned. Because if we're talking about the capacity for movement, this guy has pretty much got it all. He can walk on foot, slither on his belly, climb to high places, and it turns out he can even fly. And he does all of this without the use of eyes. He's basically a giant walking mouth who stomps around angrily, a creature of unfettered desire, perhaps the very antithesis of the Buddhist concept of awakening which has also been translated as enlightenment. And someone who's in pursuit of such a state might tell you that death is not the ending of consciousness, even though one's present body must eventually be left behind. From what I understand of the Buddhist perspective, it's thought that a conscious being who dies would be reborn in another life, perhaps as an animal, or that self might be reborn as a human or a hungry ghost, a god, or a hell being. Each mode of existence is temporary, but the cycle of rebirth continues without end. And the same self, driven by the same motivations, keeps making the same choices that lead to the same suffering over and over and over again. This cyclic existence is known as samsara, Samsara is often depicted in the form of a wheel, held by impermanence, kept in motion by the three poisons spinning at its center. These poisons are ignorance, hatred, and greedy desire. But the awakened one, Buddha, stands outside of the wheel with a finger pointing to the moon, showing the way to escape. Since the ocean of samsara is without beginning or end, all conscious beings have been wandering about in it through countless lives. But we're unaware. These memories have been wiped from our minds. So if the day should ever come when we are reunited with someone we once held dear, how are we supposed to know? How do we recognize a beloved friend and companion when they are tied to us by a forgotten thread? How can we show the depth of our appreciation for someone we cared for in a past or future life when all we see in the present is someone standing in the way, a hindrance to be crushed, like that girl in the marketplace, or that spider on the ground. According to an old Japanese legend of Zelda, there was once a young man named Bado who was on his way to rescue the woman he believed would be his wife. And this guy pretty much has it all. He is appallingly, willfully ignorant of the way that his romantic feelings for Zelda are not being reciprocated. He's nurturing a deep-seated hatred for Link on account of his closeness with Zelda. And when it comes to desire, yeah, this frog is thirsty. All things considered, Bado makes for a pretty good antithesis of the Buddhist concept of being awake. 
Now, if you played Skyward Sword in English, you'll know that Bruce met a goose and this guy was named Groose. But in the Japanese text, the name Bado is also a bird pun. The name is similar to the katakana transliteration of the English word bird, which shows up in game anytime there's a reference to a loft wing or a loftobado. Shorten the vowel sound, and you end up with a transliteration of the name Bud. But he actually prefers to call himself Budsama, which is the same honorific that Girahimusama invites you to use in his presence. This honorific is at one point translated with the word big. And if we stick with that choice and call this guy Big Bud, maybe the original pun still lands. Link steers his bud with the crimson hair towards a temple where there's an old lady sitting beneath a remarkable red cloak. Its design bears some resemblance to the red hats sometimes worn by a sect of Tibetan monks, but the old lady's garment might have actually been inspired by a kind, heroic man she had once met, long ago in the distant past. <laughs> Gently, she tells Bud that the threads of his fate are not arranged in the way he had hoped, and Zelda's thread has already been tied to someone else. So Bud asks the old lady, who that person might be. Bud is horrified, so he spits out a curse, telling Link that he will not offer a shred of acknowledgement. Not a single drop of it. And he runs away. But it's not like Link needed a bully's acknowledgement in the first place. That's when Bud realizes that maybe he's not so special after all. And as he thrashes about in a sea of darkness, like a dying frog, at that very moment, an angel reaches out for him, holding a cherished memory. No. Towards the end of a very long road, as Link prepares to cross over to a distant time where he will at last be reunited with Zelda. <laughs> Just then, he realizes. <laughs> and yet, Bud has finally recognized when enough is enough. And with that, it's time to return to that question from before. Will these cursed souls ever recognize their hope of escape? All the way back at the beginning of the game, 
the school headmaster had wanted to adjust the day's scheduled timeline of events. Link's loft wing was missing, and a flight contest was about to begin, so Kaipora tells Link to check with the instructor organizing the contest to see if it can be delayed. Zelda points out, however, that this instructor would most likely respond by checking with the headmaster for permission to delay the contest. And that would create a loop, as though there were two dragons forming a circle, each consuming the other's tail. Speaking of dragons, Link eventually needs help from one, who's not really up to the task at the moment. Not far away, the dragon's robots had planted a seed from the Tree of Life, in hope that it would bear fruit that could cure the dragon's disease. But in such impoverished soil, all they got was an old twisted thing, standing forsaken in the midst of a desert waste. So, using a time shift stone, Link takes the seedling back with him to the present day temple, where Bud has pointed out that there's a promising patch of soil right next to the gate of time. Link jumps back in time to plant the seed, and upon returning to the present, just look. From the way Bud talks about it, it sounds as though the tree has been there the whole time. But if that were the case, Link wouldn't have done what he did to plant the tree in the first place. And yet, if the tree had not been there until Link traveled back in time to plant it, then how is it that the old lady is wearing that remarkable red cloak? If the one who planted the seed of its aesthetic has not yet left the present. If the tree was not already there, then how is it that bud began to blossom. If the very reason that he did so is because the old lady remembered the courage and the kindness that he had not yet shown. Even if he couldn't see it, the tree was always there. Somehow, it must have just been hidden away until its moment of revelation. So how is it that the Tree of Life came to exist in the garden? Maybe somewhere, in an office, the arbiters of the timeline were negotiating that topic. But then Zelda did say that Link didn't really need to worry too much about the details back when the contest schedule was being discussed. On the other hand, when the tree is finally revealed, Bud tells us that maybe there's some symbolism here that deserves our attention. And if you want my interpretation, I think the tree symbolizes hope. It may have been forgotten, but it's still there. And it's still growing. I mentioned earlier that there is a lot of symbolism at play in the battle that concludes the ancient cistern. When Girahim enlists the help of a robot, and gives that robot an order to kill. Because there's a certain pest that needs to be dealt with. And there's a servant on hand who seems able to do the job. In the Japanese text, this foe is called a demon-tainted sacred tool. Whatever this thing might originally have been, it's been corrupted and flooded with a poisonous mal-intent. And why does it laugh when the battle is over and victory has been won and a new day is dawning? Maybe this laughter has something to do with the way that Link has been going in circles, counterclockwise, all throughout the ancient cistern, leading him back to the place where he started. Open your eyes. This battle takes place inside the bud 
of a lotus flower. In Buddhism, the blossoming of a lotus flower can symbolize enlightenment. Wake up, Link. Hence, the bud of a lotus signifies the beginning of the journey of spiritual growth that leads to this awakening. The Lotus Sutra teaches that everyone has the potential to emerge from the mud and bloom. Now, if you take a close look at this automaton's torso, you can see that it has the heads of two lions emblazoned upon it. This makes sense given that this contraption is guarding the room that holds a sacred flame, and pairs of lion statues often guard the entrances to shrines and temples across East Asia. Lions can also be depicted as protectors of Buddha, the lion of the Shakya clan, and they can also show up in the company of bodhisattvas. A bodhisattva is someone who has attained enlightenment, but rather than passing away into nirvana, the bodhisattva chooses to stay behind in samsara for the sake of all others who are still there and are still suffering in each of its realms. The appearance of a bodhisattva can be fairly intimidating, similar to the statues Link encounters in the Earth Temple. These statues may look like demons, but from the hand gestures that they're making, known as the Vitarka Mudra, you can recognize that they are teaching Sometimes, maybe it's helpful to have a teacher who can be more intimidating than your enemies. That said, according to the teachings of Shantidewa about the way of the Bodhisattva, our enemies can be valuable teachers as well, providing some of the best opportunities for practicing patience. And if we treasure someone for having been a good teacher, maybe we can offer some of that gratitude to our enemies too. You might have noticed during the ancient cistern that a number of chakras had made appearances in some form or another. For example, there was that third eye that appeared back when a foe's helmet flew off in the middle of battle. Maybe you remember that doorway going right through the throat of the central statue which eventually rises up to be crowned by a representation of the crown chakra. According to the most well-known Hindu system of chakras, there are thought to be, primarily, seven of these energy centers in the body. This number happens to correspond to the number of dungeons Link passes through on his way to finding the Triforce. But the reason I bring these up is because there's one chakra in particular that seems to be of particular significance to the story. The throat. Over and over again, at parts of the game laced with so much symbolic meaning, there's this repetition of imagery pertaining to the throat, the chakra of purification, that filters out poison from Amrit, the nectar of immortality. Nectar that falls down from above, from the Bindu Chakra, only to be burned up in the navel, unless it's caught by the throat. The Hindu story of Samudra Manthan describes devas and asuras, gods and demons, working together to churn the ocean of milk. An ocean that symbolizes consciousness, because it was said that Amrit could be found somewhere in these depths. But the first thing that emerged from the ocean was poison. Halahal. Deadly enough to bring the demise of all existence. The devas and asuras cried out for help, and Lord Shiva responded. Shiva took the halahal, and the god drank the poison. 
holding the poison within the throat. Thereafter, Shiva was known as Nilakanth, the blue-throated one. Did I do a good job of retelling that story? There are parts I left out. But that sort of thing is bound to happen pretty much any time that a story changes hands. And in the case of Skyward Sword, let's remember that it's the job of localization teams to adapt the story as seems necessary for the sake of audiences in different regions including regions where audiences may be unfamiliar with stories, such as the Red Thread or the Spider's Thread. And it's not exactly easy to include footnotes in a video game. That said, Skyward Sword strikes me as being the kind of story that's been crafted by someone who happens to have a case of a frog in the throat. The story has quite a lot to say, but it's not just going to spit out its full meaning and trample all the fun of interpretation, leaving no room for mystery. But this sort of approach can lead to trouble down the road, the more the story's original context gets hidden behind layers of obscurity, whether they be translation choices, cultural differences, or historical distance. Just imagine, for example, if something that the story was using as a symbol of purification were to lose that association. If that sort of thing were overlooked, the text in question might possibly be misunderstood. Maybe I've just been grasping at air this whole time, but in the end, well, I guess I'll leave that for you to decide. But you should realize that I may have been tampering with some of these stories myself. After all, I never even told you how the story of the spider's thread ends. At the very moment that Kandata cried out at all the others climbing up with him, the thread broke just above him, and he fell down into the darkest depths. Buddha's face was tinged with sorrow as Khandatta sank like a stone into the pond of blood. However, back up in paradise, the lotus flowers were undisturbed, and Buddha walked away. This ending you just heard is unique to Akutagawa's retelling of a story spun by Karis, adapted from Dostoyevsky's novel, which preserved the words that he had heard from a peasant. One storyteller after another who picked up an old thread to spin it anew. Which is the kind of thing that storytellers do. Including Jesus, when he told a story about an everlasting separation of one from another. There was a rich man, Jesus once said, who wore fine clothes and feasted every day. I guess you could say that he was the sort of person who pretty much had it all. And there outside his door was an impoverished man named Lazarus, who longed for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Similar to the folktales that this parable imitates, the fortunes of the two men are reversed in the afterlife. Lazarus is comforted, and the other man suffers torment in flames. He asks for Lazarus to be sent to dip the tip of his finger in water and to cool the tongue of someone who had never shown such kindness to him. This request is denied and no drop of water reaches his tongue. So he asks instead that a messenger be sent back to warn his family about this afterlife so that they can change their ways in response. But this cry for help is also refused. The living should already be able to recognize the need for mercy. But this is not the way this kind of story is supposed to go. If you're familiar with the folktales that preceded it, 
there's always a messenger sent back to reveal the afterlife. And if not, does it mean that what we heard about the afterlife was hypothetical? Which begs the question, would you want to live in a paradise that spares not a crumb of compassion for someone in torment, where the ones who have it all show no mercy to the others down below? Not a single drop of it. So, is there any way for Link and Zelda to escape the curse left by someone they used the power of the Triforce to kill? If you want my answer, there's another story you should know first. According to an old Chinese legend, there was once a carp who dreamed of leaping over a waterfall. It was said that if any carp could leap through the Dragon's Gate atop this waterfall, that carp would become a dragon. So the little carp tried, and failed pretty badly. But that carp swam back to the waterfall and tried to make the leap again, and again, over and over and over again, that carp kept trying, until, at last,
Mm-hmm. <laughs>